What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. So we've talked a bit about how Nintendo is heavily rumored to have a Direct in September, but now more information is coming out that's even pointing towards it being a big blowout for The Legend of Zelda, as well as other titles from the GameCube. We'll go over that here today. Also, we are gonna be talking about Tokyo Game Show as we have the entire streaming schedule and even some teasing from Konami for a big game reveal that I'm sure won't just disappoint everyone. And we also had some games revealed for PlayStation Plus for the month of September, showing that Sony has a very strange problem with their premium tier. Guys, if you enjoy these videos, make sure you hit that like button, helps out a ton. And if new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And we're gonna start today with God of War Ragnarok. Very excited for this title to release in November, but details and gameplay footage has been pretty scarce with the game only a couple of months out now, but Game Informer does have this as their big cover story, and we're starting to see some of the details trickle out. We can see this posted up from Game Informer through Push Square, where they say, now each weapon will have what is called weapon signature moves, allowing Kratos to fuse them with ice or fire elemental power, respectively for the Leviathan Axe, this is called Frost Awaken, and for the Blades of Chaos, Whiplash. And it seems like they're playing around, of course, with the combat to make it different from God of War 2018. But the thing that's odd to me, as I mentioned, gameplay footage has been pretty scarce for this title. And even Game Informer mentioned it was about four minutes of gameplay footage that they had to show off. It does make me wonder if there's something that they would need to reveal still that could be a big twist early on in the game. And that's why we're not seeing as much of it. Uh, Hard to say there, but I am wondering if we're going to have a big time God of War reveal through a state of play leading up to its release and have some massive twist revealed to us, but I guess we'll find out as we get closer to November. Also, we did have Last of Us Part 1 reviews drop online. We can see the Metacritic score here sitting at an 89, and yes, that puts it like five or six points below uh, Last of Us for the PS3 and the PS4. This is currently on 97 critic reviews. I saw it go up from an 88 to an 89, so I guess it's possible it could either go back to an 88 or even uh, top out there at a 90. The critic review split at a 93 positive, four mixed, and it is kind of, it's kind of all over the place just based on how the reviewer is looking at this. For example, if they're just saying, hey, it's a better version or the best version we have of The Last of Us, which people will look at and say it's one of the best games they've ever played, then yeah, it's gonna get a higher review score. Others though, had a different approach, like Attack of the Fanboy, for example, immediately pointing out that $70 price tag, and if this is something that is even necessary, considering it is heavily reliant on you just wanting the same game, just looking visually better. And that's, of course, the part that everyone's kind of wrestling with here. Was this necessary, and was it something that should be released at $70. Well, one thing's for sure, the market will be deciding here pretty soon. It's coming up on Friday, and I'm sure we'll be talking about this quite a bit on the podcast Saturday night. Oh, and at some point this fall, we're gonna have Halo Infinite's season three release that should bring Forge in some way. Like, we're supposed to get a beta for it, but we've been seeing more and more footage get out there online of people using Forge through these different flights and test plays. And some of the stuff people are making is pretty impressive as an example. You can see this over on Twitter from Red saying, I'm making Toy Story in Halo Infinite's Forge mode, even adding Jenga where they're knocking blocks over and trying to uh, have the tower tip. And th this is great. Like. They, they really needed Forge at launch. This could have, I think, changed the entire history of Halo Infinite, how we view it today. And obviously Forge will be even further along now since it's not even publicly available. But once it does, 343 can just kind of get out of the way. The community will take it from here. The fact that we're seeing people build out Doom or even Toy Story, I mean, it seems like at least Forge itself has a lot going for it, a lot of options and things you can do. So to me, the sooner you can get this out there, the better, because Halo Infinite certainly needs the content. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get to the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with all the talk right now around Nintendo and a Direct that is potentially just a couple of weeks away. Now, this showed up from Jeff Grubb over on his uh, podcast where he talks about all things Nintendo, so make sure you check that out. But we can see some transcriptions here from BGC, where they say, to be clear, guys, the one thing that we are very, very sure is being announced at this Direct are the Wind Waker and Twilight Princess ports 
for the Switch. This, again, was said on Jeff Grubb's podcast, where he goes on to say, yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of Zelda stuff at this thing. I think this is like a Zelda blowout for Nintendo. 100% there's the Nintendo Direct in September. It's that simple. There is still some uncertainty around whether this will be a general Direct, maybe a mini. I actually am leaning towards it just being a general Direct I think from what's going around right now. Uh, and as Jeff does mention, uh, the Zelda stuff, you don't really put that into a partner direct or even a mini. If you're gonna talk about a bunch of Zelda stuff, it probably is just a big time general a Nintendo direct. Jeff even goes on to say that he's a pretty good source. The event will take place during the week. Beginning September 12th, oh yeah, following in line with my September 14th guest that yes, is just a guess, not not trying to hint towards anything there. Just, you know, just going with September 14th as a, I think that's a, a pretty good guess for a, a big time direct happening there. Uh, but they also talk about Metroid Prime and even kicked around the idea of F-Zero. And it's like, that's that seems like a lot of remasters. If let's just say F-Zero, like the talk around F-Zero has been, Nintendo doesn't know what to do with it because it's at its core, a racing game, which I mean, yeah, but they're comparing it to them already having a racing game like Mario Kart, even though I would argue F-Zero feels much different from Mario Kart, sure, I guess if you break it all the way down to the, the like to, to what it is essentially, they're two racing games. So if that's the case, how would people feel if they went back and got F-Zero GX from the GameCube and just moved it to the Switch at full price? That That's the big question there. If they did online and all this stuff and of course made it look better for uh, modern displays at 1080p. I mean, how really, how would people look at that as a $60 game? That's that's something I'd be curious to see. And who knows, maybe we will, because at this point, it seems like they've just talked about a bunch of remasters from the GameCube. I mean, think about what we would expect and what's been rumored so far. The, uh, the Wind Waker, uh, this Wind Waker and Twilight Princess bundle, which Twilight Princess, best version, from the GameCube. I assume that's where Nintendo would be getting it from. And then we hear about this Metroid Prime remaster remake from the GameCube, potentially F-Zero GX from the GameCube once again. This could be a big Legend of Zelda blowout, sure, because maybe Breath of the Wild 2 makes it in there, but it would also just kind of be a GameCube blowout. Now, we could also see other remasters reports like Kid Icarus. And what if that was the theme of this Direct? Because that's kind of what was brought up by Jeff during his podcast is, what if the Direct's theme were just remasters or old classics being brought to the Switch and maybe some newer stuff being thrown in there like Metroid Prime 4 could have a look, maybe that Donkey Kong game and uh, yeah, a quick look, maybe a one more thing for Breath of the Wild 2. I, I would be excited to see something like F-Zero come back just to see the reception and if all the people calling for it would actually put their money where their mouth is for that. But I would also look at it and be like, wow, a lot of these games I've already played. But as I said before, I look at games that come back as remastered. I'm like, well, I've played it before. I'm sure everyone else has. That's not the case. There are plenty of younger gamers who are now coming into gaming and yeah, they, maybe they missed out on Wind Waker or Twilight Princess or anything there. I mean, Nintendo moved into the Wii U and no one really bought a Wii U. So, hey, I'm excited at least the idea of a general direct and I believe it is coming up in two weeks. Like I said, I think I think September 14th is a good guess, we'll see. Next up, let's talk about Tokyo Game Show as that is also starting up here in a couple of weeks. We have the entire streaming schedule that was released online. We can see this posted up. Starting on September 15th, there's the Tokyo Game Show 2022 opening program. Some other notable streams that will be taking place. Let's see, we have Microsoft. Actually, that seems to be like the big one that's kicking things off from what I can tell here. And then we have Bandai Namco Entertainment and then Capcom, all of that will be on September 15th. Microsoft even put up their own posting over on the news.xbox.com website, kind of kind of talking about this, uh, where they say we are pleased to confirm that Xbox will be making its digital return to Tokyo Game Show on September 15th. We invite fans to tune into Tokyo Game Show 2022 Xbox Stream, where you can expect to see updates on existing titles from Xbox Game Studios and titles launching from developer partners that we hope will delight players here in Japan, across Asia, and around the world. So I'll admit, I'm a little interested to see what Microsoft is gonna do here, considering this Xbox series is selling considerably better than the Xbox One, and most likely will outsell the original Xbox. And I mean, who knows, maybe it does catch the 360. That is very dependent though on how Microsoft treats the that region with releases 
could they come up with some fun surprises here at Tokyo Game Show? I I guess we'll see. And then moving to the 16th, we have 505 Games, Koei Tecmo, Sega Atlas. Keep an eye on that. Konami. Oh boy, Konami. Okay. Konami is interesting because they say they're going to announce a new game from a series. Loved around the world. VGC sources, however, suggest the reveal is unlikely to be related to its biggest classic franchises. So think of Castlevania, Silent Hill, or Metal Gear. It would be something else. I saw some people wonder if it could be Suik uh, Suikoden. I, I guess it's possible. I mean, you, it could also be not like a Yu-Gi-Oh game or, or something there. So I'm not holding my breath for Konami to surprise or any shock and all from them, but I'm hopeful. That's all I can say about Konami is one day they show up with that big reveal that has everyone excited and everyone talking again. And we'll see. Square Enix though follows them up that same day. And then we have Capcom to close things out on the 16th. On the 17th, we have D3 Publisher, let's see, Gung Ho, Online Entertainment, Level 5, Anaplex, Project Moon, and then on the 18th, we have Gung Ho, Online Entertainment once again, 110 Industries, Happy Net, and then their ending program. But it does look like there's a packed three or four days there for Tokyo Games Show, and it is, it is a little weird in the US where a lot of stuff will happen like in the middle of the night and you wake up to a massive mountain of news, but it is exciting stuff, and like I said, there are some wild cards in there. What could Xbox do and what will Konami have for us that I'm sure, like I said, won't just disappoint everyone? I guess we'll see here in a couple of weeks. Next up, let's talk about Sony and their PlayStation Plus games for the month of September, which has also led a lot of people to ask questions around this PlayStation premium service because it does seem that Sony has this very weird problem with that tier that is also the most expensive tier in their subscription service. First though, let's take a look at the games heading into PlayStation Plus Essential. They have this card up here over on PlayStation Blog. We have Need for Speed Heat that's on the PS4. I like Need for Speed Heat. I think it's a good looking game. I think it is a really fun racing game as well. The only problem I have though is the console version is still stuck at 30 FPS even on like the PS5 and the Xbox series. I, we need a patch to at least unlock the frame rate for this one. For a racing game like that, it'd feel way better at, uh, at 60 frames. We also have Grand Blue Fantasy Versus, and that's on the PS4, and then we have Tome on the PS5. These will go live on September 6th and will be available to claim and add to your account until October 3rd. So I recommend, obviously, signing in and at least claiming each one of these. And I would say, hey, take Need for Speed Heat for a spin. I also wonder if Need for Speed Heat could be going into the service because they are uh, getting close to announcing the next Need for Speed game that we've just seen footage and screenshots leak out online anyway. Seems like September could be a good time. Who knows, maybe it's part of like a state of play or, or, or something there, we'll, we'll see. Anyway, moving up to the PlayStation Plus Extra and Premium tiers. These will be available on September 20th with the big headlining game being Deathloop, which is very interesting because I thought that had like a one-year exclusivity and it would be going to Xbox Game Pass around this time. Instead, it's going in the PlayStation Plus Extra tier. I like Deathloop. I think it is a really cool game to check out. It is a PS5 exclusive built for that next-gen system, which, I mean, over the last couple of years, it, it, finding a game that you feel like really takes advantage of hardware was difficult. I think this was a good one early on, and I do recommend it. Certainly a unique game from Arcane. We also have Assassin's Creed Origins on the PS4, Watch Dogs 2 on the PS4, Dragon Ball's Universe 2 on the PS4, which uh, we're never getting Xenoverse 3, and then uh, Spirit Fair Farewell Edition on the PS4, Chicory, A Colorful Tale on the PS4, Monster Energy Supercross, that's the official video game, on the PS4 and the PS5, Alex Kidd in Miracle, Miracle World DX, PS4 and PS5, Rabbit's Invasion, the interactive TV show on the PS4, Rayman Legends on the PS4, and then Scott Pilgrim vs. The World The Game, which is an awesome addition, by the way, on the PS4. And then moving up to PlayStation Plus Premium. These would be the classics going into the service. Remember, they have the PS1, the PS2, the PS3, yes, and then the PSP that they can pull from. So let's see what awesome titles they came up with that entire library at their disposal. Siphon Filter 2 on the PS1. This is a good game. I think it's a good addition. It also will have full trophy support. Ben Studio made that announcement. So hey, Siphon Filter 2, 
good uh, good game to have go into the service there. I do recommend that. The Sly Collection on the PS3. I'm confused about this one because this has games from the PS2, right? Like, I understand from Sony's perspective, okay, this is just one game. It's a collection, but we can just throw that in there. It's streamed. There you go. But, like, why didn't just why don't you just do the Sly Cooper PS2 games natively into the service? Head scratching moment here from Sony. Uh, Sly Cooper Thieves in Time on the PS3. Remember, these are all streamed games. Bentley's Hack Pack on the PS3. Toy Story 3 on the PSP. Probably not my first guess for a PSP game that Sony would have added, but I mean they had they did Toy Story on the what on the PS1, so I, I guess they're continuing that deal, sure. And then Kingdom of Paradise on the PSP. Once again, a game that I would not have guessed. I mean, I guess it's Sony's, I think. The wait, I think they they did that game. So sure, it, it, it's an action RPG. It's not like one of the better games on the PSP that I would be recommending, but I guess it's technically better than, I don't know, Toy Story 3. And that's the big talking point currently is the PlayStation Plus premium tier just doesn't seem like it's getting that big push from Sony like a lot of us were hoping they would. Like at this point, some people are paying $120 per year for the classic games on top of, yes, game trials, but let's face it, you see PS1, PS2, PS3, and PSP games that could be going in. That's probably what you're signing up for as opposed to, oh, Rollerdrome has like a 40 minute demo or, or something like that. It's been very odd that of all the PS1, PS2, PS, all these different games that are out there, they're picking games that probably aren't going to wow people overall, especially when you have something like just Legend of Dragoon out there for the PS1. I feel like these kind of months, Sony would be able to get away with if they showed up with a really strong offering out of the gate, but they didn't even do that. And that probably means that we just shouldn't really expect much going into this premium service for these classic games, which I think is kind of a shame overall because in turn, that could make the PlayStation 5 have an even larger library, especially, like I said, for new gamers who are coming in to experience some of the classic titles. But that's kind of where we are now. At this point, I'm not really expecting much from this PlayStation Plus premium tier until Sony proves otherwise. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about an investment from Sony and Tencent into From Software. And this was an interesting headline to see, mostly because it does look like Sony is becoming more and more involved with From Software, but also Tencent finding their way in there alongside of them. We could see this post up by Reuters saying, units of Tencent and Sony will take minority stakes in From Software Inc., publisher in Japan of hit action role-playing title Elden Ring, via a third-party allotment of new shares. Following the transaction, which will raise 36.4 billion yen, or $263 million, units of Tencent Holdings and Sony Group Corp will hold 16.25% and just over 14% respectively, with publishing giant Katakawa retaining just under 70%. So neither Sony nor Tencent have like a controlling stake in the company. That's still Katakawa, which means FromSoft should just be business as usual. However, it does appear, at least when it comes to Sony, that the relationship is becoming closer with From Software. Tencent mostly just invests and they're very quiet. They're like silent investors for the most part. They're just kind of putting money wherever they can and hoping something just works for them. So that's kind of the way I'm viewing it from that angle. But again, you should definitely keep an eye on Tencent because they're just everywhere right now. The question is mostly, would this then in turn have games for, for From Software be exclusive for Sony going forward? Not necessarily, no. I think there is a possibility that some games could. Like, as an example, we hear about this Armored Core game that seems like it's going to be announced at any time now. That very well could even be something that FromSoft works with Sony and they publish it, or Bandai Namco publishes it and Sony comes in and gets some sort of timed exclusivity or just full console exclusivity. I... I don't know, though, if going forward it's just all going to be for Sony. I think this is just Sony with uh, strategical investments for a company and developer that has proven themselves time and time again. And, I mean, things just absolutely exploded with Elden Ring. So, basically, hey, 
they want a piece of that with investing and they think down the line their money will do better there uh, in From Software. That's kind of the way I'm reading it now, but hey, we'll see what happens with Armored Core when that gets announced and if there is an Xbox logo and a PlayStation logo underneath or just one of them. And before we go to the comment of the day, we're gonna take a look at the poll that I posted up yesterday where I ask, which franchise from Nintendo is most likely to appear with a game in the rumored upcoming Direct? Donkey Kong, 59%, and we've had a lot of rumors around that, so that kind of makes sense. But yeah, number two, people really have hopes for Pikmin. You know, I would love for the Pikmin community to finally get that W, but I, I don't know. Pikmin 4 just sounds like it's been rebooted over and over again. The one thing that'll be a big twist, though, is if Pikmin 4 has actually been done for a couple of years and, and Nintendo's just been holding on to it and, and they, they announce it and it comes out three months later. That would be, that'd be an interesting time online. But yeah, I guess looking at this, if I had to pick a couple, it'd be Donkey Kong would probably be the most likely. And then I would go to F-Zero and then Kid Icarus. But again, we'll find out soon. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Brian saying, I would love to be a fly on the wall in that Logitech board meeting where they explain how that cloud console handheld would be successful. The Switch hybrid concept Makes sense. The Steam Deck high-end handheld spec with the Linux-based Steam OS access to all Steam games model makes a lot of sense. It's completely baffling to me why anyone would be interested in a handheld that would require internet to use. I'm sure they'll have a press release at some point where they'll go over it, but I'm really curious how that initial pitch went. So if I had to sell this to Logitech and Tencent, I'm an engineer or just marketing or something, and I'm like, hey, let's try this out. How do we tell the supervisors about this to convince them? I would just sell them on the future going forward. Hey, Microsoft's behind it, Google's behind it, Amazon's behind it. Let's get involved through the hardware side of things and plan for 10 or 15 years down the line, not like, oh, this has to sell now. Like, view this as an investment, and if things work out and these internet companies can, uh, can figure it out and actually innovate and, and make the service better, or who knows, maybe uh, Starlink takes off and the entire world is blanketed in Wi-Fi. We wanna be positioned as the default for hardware that you may wanna buy if you don't wanna have to just use your phone, right? Like as your, as your main primary way to access these streaming gaming services. That's mostly how I would pitch it. Tencent being involved also tells me, once again, they'd be looking to invest and put money up as a silent partner for the future. So we'll see when they present this thing. The fact that the marketing materials are out there tells me it's probably happening pretty soon. And ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here today. Well, there's the Nintendo Direct coming up that is reportedly a big Zelda blowout, but also talks of a bunch of remasters being there. How'd you feel about that? And then also, what about Konami and their Tokyo Game Show announcement? Do you think it'll actually surprise a lot of people? And then PlayStation Plus Premium. How have you felt about the classic collection so far? Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.